So good morning. Phones away. I'm David Ferriero. I'm the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here to the National Archives, or my house, as I like to say. How many of you have ever been here before? Great. So the purpose of today is to give you some idea of the different kinds of functions that we have here at the, at the National Archives, but it's also an opportunity for you to think about, as you're studying and thinking about careers, opportunities for you to get involved in the work of the government in a way that you probably didn't realize um, was possible for you. The National Archives is responsible for all the records of the government. That means all of the agencies, you know, like the Department of Agriculture or Department of Energy, in the, in the course of their business every day, they're creating lots of records, some of them on paper, but mostly electronic these days. And our job is to make sure that those records are be, being created and taken care of in a way that 100 years from now, people are going to be able to come to the National Archives and look at those records and determine, make judgments about how effective the government was to track how decisions were made. Why did they decide to do this as opposed to that? So it's a huge responsibility. Um, we've been at it since 1934. And at this point, we have in our holdings about 13 billion pieces of paper. 13 billion pieces of paper. That's one and a half million trees. If you laid those pieces of paper end to end, they would circle the globe 87 times. So that's a lot of paper. We're in 44 facilities around the country, and we're responsible for 14 presidential libraries. So all of the records of presidents from Herbert Hoover all the way up to Barack Obama are part of our holdings. Presidential libraries in West Branch, Iowa, all the way up to Chicago, Illinois, in our, in our holdings. And people come from all over the world to um, read and use our records. And we have more than a million people a year upstairs going through the rotunda to see the most precious of our documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. And it's just amazing, as I said, we didn't start getting serious about the records until 1934, 1935. It's just amazing that those charters upstairs in the rotunda have survived. They were signed in Philadelphia, where the capital was at the time. They were dragged to New York when the capital changed, brought here to Washington as the capital moved to Washington at risk during the War of 1812 when the British burned the town. The night before that fire, a clerk in the State Department rolled the charters up, stuffed them into linen sacks, commandeered a wagon on the street, and took the charters of freedom into the hills of Virginia. And that's the only reason that they're sitting in the rotunda today, the, the quick action of a clerk in the State Department. The fastest growing part of the collection is electronic mail, as you might expect. I think you've seen a lot in the press recently about the use of electronic mail and social media, especially tweets. Our records start with the Oaths of Allegiance signed at Valley Forge by George Washington and his troops and go all the way up to the tweets that are being created in the White House as I am speaking. That's our job, to um, collect all of those uh, tweets and make sure that they're available just as the paper is available for future generations to be able to use. So all of that work that we do to ensure that those records are available uh, takes a village of workers, different kinds of competencies, different kinds of staffs, and the tables out outside kind of describe the kinds of roles, um, the kind of jobs that make that access possible. We have preservation and conservation staff to make sure that the paper especially and the film is taken care of in a way that will last 100 years, 500 years. We have research people, research librarians and curators and archivists who work with people so that they get access to the information. We do a lot 
of digitization, turning paper into digital copies so people around the world can access them without having to come here. So a great variety of different kinds of jobs that rely on different kinds of skills that give you a sense of just how big and broad the, the scope of the National Archives is. So that's who we are and what we do, and I hope you take advantage of the time here to ask questions, to take a look around and get into the rotunda to get um, a close-up look of the Declaration of Independence. I'm happy to answer any questions. Or you can yell. <laughs> no questions? Yes. Uh, so yell. Where does the data go? Uh, where does the data go? Where does the data go? Uh, what data? You mean the electronic records? Yeah. Um, we, we capture them and put them in our electronic record archive. Sam McClure is at the table. And Sam McClure outside is at a table to discuss, fill you in on what we're planning for the next version of our electronic record archive. Huge database with all the electronic records. Yes? Where do you store all the physical records? Uh, 44 facilities around the country. Um, we have a huge facility out of College Park in Maryland on the campus. This building, um, huge facility in St. Louis where all the military records are, anyone who ever served in the military, and all the civilian personnel records. Um, and then other facilities from Seattle, Washington to uh, Waltham, Massachusetts. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that you had 14 government libraries. What are, like, why are there just 14? No, it's because there wasn't, uh, at, just as there was no president, no um, national archives, there was no presidential library system until uh, Franklin Roosevelt. So Franklin Roosevelt created the, the contributed his library as the first presidential library. And then Herbert Hoover uh, decided he wanted one, so starting with Herbert Hoover going forward. And all the other, the papers and uh, materials from the other previous presidents are scattered all over the country, some at the Library of Congress, some in um, other kinds of collections. Yes? Why do we rely on technology to store all our data? Um, it's very expensive to store paper. Um, it doesn't um, make it easy for people from around the world to have access to it. Our goal is to make it available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and the only way to do that is to have it in electronic form. Um, it's more efficient to um, create and store electronically so there are lots of um, financial economic benefits to, as well as, as access benefits to having it electronic. And um, um, as you know, when you have an assignment, you, the first thing you do probably is go online, right? To see if you can find information about it. You probably Google, right? So we want to make sure that when you Google, you find National Archives stuff um, that's of use to you. So security is a huge problem um, at, for each of our facilities and our, uh, what I would call the high-end things, the most valuable documents like the Declaration of Independence have special security arrangements. Um, we have um, kept all of our very precious documents in vaults that have limited access. Only two or three people have access to them. Um, and uh, we have tight security, entrance security, exit security, so all kinds of measures to guarantee that the material is, is safe. Yes? The safest way to display? 
Yeah, we're really concerned. If you see, uh, if you go into the rotunda and see how dark it is, it has to do with the amount of light that we expose those documents to. We limit the amount of light. Environmental conditions are controlled. Those are encased in a special um, environment so that they're, we are reducing the potential for the ink to disappear. Yeah, we think that they're state-of-the-art um, enclosures right now. Yes? Yeah, but it's, it's, uh, the cybersecurity issues are huge um, and concerns about protecting the electronic uh, information are, are things that we deal with every day. And if you talk to Sam McClure at his table, he'll talk to you about the, the thinking that's going into the, the new version of our electronic <coughs> records archive to ensure that it can't be hacked. Yes? I can't hear you. Sure, but this is a government-wide problem, as you know. Um, and uh, we're, we're approaching this not just as the National Archives, but as the U.S. government. Yes? The museum. You, you, um, I don't know. When was the museum established? The, Oh, yeah, but the museum. Oh, the National Archives Museum? Yeah. The public process? The, yeah, the public process was 2003. 2003. The museum was a couple years ago, right? So 2003 is when we, well, we, we really became you know, a full-fledged museum. The rotunda was designed um, with the intent that those original documents would sit there. And so when we opened in 35, um, Everything but the declaration was there, right? Yeah, the the Bill of Rights was the only one there. So the Constitution wasn't there. The Library of Congress had custody of the Constitution and the, and the Declaration of Independence until 1952. And that's another story which I won't get into today. Yes? So it's possible to make claims about how things happened or um, what laws really said, uh, what the intent was of a law, how we got into an international situation like a war. Um, and it's possible to rewrite history by saying, by just saying it happened in a different way. This place is responsible for ensuring that the documents that tell the real story are saved and preserved and are um, available for your ability to hold the government accountable. So in order to do that, it's the originals that we need. And that's what we do. And we take that very seriously. And that's why our concerns around cybersecurity with all electronic information is to ensure that people can't change, not only delete, but change the content of those electronic records. Yes, sorry. The document itself doesn't change. The interpretation of history changes as new information is discovered, definitely. But the original content of those records does not change. The, um, and 
this is this is just my own opinion. The ease with which electronic information can be hacked or accessed or destroyed or deleted is a much greater threat than the access, the, the issues around paper content. No way about it. Yes? There will be a point where we're out of the paper business completely. Yeah. Yes? What is your relationship with the Library of Congress? Library of Congress is responsible for collecting everything that isn't published by the government. So anything created in the United States, basically, um, they collect. And they have wonderful special collections and archival collections of the earlier uh, pre-1934 presidential records also, materials. But we're responsible for the records, so anything that was created by the government, um, we have here in, in this place. A lot of overlap in terms of subject area and complementary collections. And that goes for the Smithsonian too. The Smithsonian, the Library of Congress, and the National Archives have uh, many complementary collections. In fact, we just collaborated on creating a, uh, an app on World War I with three institutions. Yes? Was the Declaration of Independence always here, or was it over there at some time? Yeah, it was at the Library of Congress. Um, it was in the State Department, um, and then it was moved to the Library of Congress, and, um, and this building it was designed for the, um, the rotunda was designed to house the, the declaration. In fact, there was like a tabernacle that was built in the rotunda for the declaration itself. But the Librarian of Congress didn't refuse to give it up. Um, so it wasn't until 1952, with a different Librarian of Congress in place, that um, it came here under with great pomp, um, heavy security, and tanks and military people bringing it down the street and up the stairs into the rotunda. Yes? So is the Library of Congress still open to the It's Declaration and Constitution of the Bill of Rights. And that's kind of unique. You know, other countries don't, um, don't celebrate their charters the way, that we, the way we do. Yes. I noticed within the last five years, you guys really got into like storing social media. Yeah. Uh, what kind of work goes into storing pieces of social media? I mean, uh, say someone would like to remove that. Is that impossible, or do you store everything from the United States? Depends on um, wh who created it and the laws that govern that. The two sets of laws is the Presidential Records Act and the Federal Records Act. The Presidential Records Act is pretty clear about everything that's created by the President or in the, in the White House that we would be capturing. On the federal record side, which controls what happens in the executive branch agencies, the cabinet agencies, for instance, it depends on the purpose of the use of electronic, um, of social media. If, it's, if it is used to communicate new information for the first time, or to provide procedures or policy, then it was cap would be captured. All of, the, all of those records are, are scheduled, they're described in advance about what the purpose of the records were and how long they need to be kept, and it's pretty prescribed. Yes? Yes, classified as well. And there, there's classified information in the presidential library, in several of the presidential libraries also. Yeah. I can't hear you. Have you ever taken data from other countries? Taken data from other countries? Um, there are several examples of things that we have in our holdings from other countries, like the records of the Nuremberg trials um, after World War II are here. 
Yes. Oh, it depends on who's responsible. <laughs> you mean it, if it got out of here? Um, it, it depends on the situation. I, you know, I, I couldn't tell you. One more question. Yes. Papers from yeah, you mean the records from from the agencies, for instance. It depends on who created it, uh, where they were created, and which facility. Uh, of those 44 facilities is responsible for housing it. So it could be, uh, if, it's the, if it's the State Department, for instance, it would be out in College Park. So they're divided up depending upon which agency created it. So they're all over the country. And depending upon which agency created it, um, it would go to the, uh, the appropriate facility. OK. Good morning, everyone. I'm here. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, you asked great questions, and I'm so glad I was here to hear them. So I'm going to just show you some great documents that we have. Yes? Yeah. OK. It's okay, They'll, we'll catch up. So what I'd like to do is, um, at the end of this, sort of inspire you to do more research. How many of you have been here before and done research? Okay, so you've done research at the National Archives, mostly online or at the Okay, all right, great. So you've been here, and I hope that you'll want to do more research, whether it's online or at our facilities, and as you heard from David Ferrier, the Archivist of the United States, we only have 44 of them all over the country. Um, when you get a researcher card, it's good for a year at any of our facilities. And when you come to the facility, you can also, it, you get access to other databases that we pay for, the archives pays for, and they're free to you when you come and do research at our facility. Also, sometimes public libraries have those kinds of databases, but they're a little bit more limited. So your research card at the National Archives gets you a lot of access. All right, let's go on here. So basically, what kind of primary sources can you find at the National Archives? Um, and I'll give you examples. Are there any use restrictions? You've heard that they are from our records are from federal facilities, government facilities, so you'd think they'd all be public, but not all of them are because not all of them come from federal agencies. And are they all available online? You heard we've got 13 billion pieces of paper plus other stuff, motion pictures, so a tiny staff with a tiny budget. So I'll, you can imagine if it's all going to be online. The first question is always, how is my topic related to the National Archives and to government agencies, federal government agencies? And you might think about which federal agency then might have records related to your topic. It's not an easy question, but we make it a bit easier because when you go on our website, we have something called the Guide to Federal Records which will then give you more information and give you ideas for where you might look. So as you heard from, from um, David Ferriero, is that in the old days before 1930s, some of our records were held in the garage of the White House, okay, with 
tires and all kinds of things there. So right now we're in, in very good shape um, online and you can also send your research question to the National Archives to see whether we have what you need or not. Our 44 facilities are all over the country. Um, and if you have any questions, let me know. By the way, my background is in education. I'm part of the Education and Public Program staff. So when you're talking about careers, we don't only have people who have MLSs, which is um, library science and archives. We have people in um, uh, accounting, you know, they, we have to keep it all together and not spend all the money in one place. Uh, we have administrators, we have educators, we have people who do exhibits, and you can go outside and talk to everybody. We have people with chemical backgrounds, chemistry backgrounds, who do our preservation. So we have, and I'm in our College Park facility, which I love, it's beautiful. It's the largest modern archives in the world. And we've got many different places online that you can find our, our resources. Archives.gov, of course, docs teach for educators and for students. We have a lot of documents, thousands of documents there, and not just paper records, but films and photographs and all. Um, our catalog, it's what we call it, the catalog has everything that is online should be in there. We have a YouTube channel. So you can find music that's in the archives, um, maps that are on the in the archives there. Archivesfoundation.org, a lot of times we have great programs and they're recorded, and you can find them there. And then presidential library websites, they have their own collection of audiovisuals. So for example, I might not find something in College Park, where, by the way, we have all our special media plus our textual. Textual means paper records. And generally speaking, everything from 1900 up is in College Park. Everything earlier than that is here in Archives 1, is what we call it in DC. But there are some exceptions. What will you not find at the National Archives? Remember, we are, we are the holders and provide access to records of the federal government not state government, not county, not city, and not church records will not be here. That's really important to know. So when I started working at the National Archives at College Park about nine years ago, I was surprised the first week I was there to find this photograph on the fifth floor by our still pictures um, uh, department. I grew up with her music and I wondered why she was in the archives because she's a South African musician, singer, and human rights archivist, uh, ar I mean, sorry, activist. What I want to do is show you some important things, some important clues. So the US Information Agency has, it sort of has our propaganda for the rest of the world. And it's not normally showed here for at least 12 years after it's produced. This was part of a festival and, and it was recorded. Do you see 306? That is the number, the record group number. That's really important if you take anything away. Record group number assigned to the US Information Agency. So right away, we know that it's US Information Agency and record group 306. Now, do you see the source? It doesn't say public domain. It says that it came from the TV station, which means if you wanted to use it, you'd have to get permission in writing from them. And a lot of people will give it to you, especially students and especially National History Day students. Um, and that's why we don't have a lot of our things online because it is private. Now, a lot of times people, our archivists will say, come to the, to do research at the National Archives as the last thing you do in your research. So what did I do to begin with when I saw this woman's photograph? I, I read her books. She's got two autobiographies, which led me to other things and other people she knew, and I read those books as well. That's how I learned that she actually performed with Harry Belafonte at JFK's birthday. So I went online to look for it at the National Archives and didn't find it. 
But then I realized the GFK library probably has it. So I created a presentation um, that I gave here and at, our, at both of our facilities so I could call them up and say, do you have any pictures related to this particular show, this uh, GFK's birthday? And if so, let me know, can you scan them for me? They did, and they put them online. So these are now available online. So as you can see, this, oops, this is in the public domain, so anyone can use it. The number here is really important because let's say you actually wanted, you were writing a book and you wanted a really high resolution picture. You'd want to get that original picture and then have it scanned at a high resolution. This is not high res. Here's another photograph from JFK Library. Um, here's JFK himself and Harry Belafonte is right, oops, I'm sorry, I keep doing this. Is, is this guy right here? Do any of you know who he is? Great. He's an activist, a musician, a singer, an actor, um, and very active even today. Voice of America, we have thousands. Now, these are reels. You, you, you know, they're reels of um, radio shows and radio programs created as part of the U.S. Information Agency. So when when I talked with our motion pictures people in their research room, they told me that they had a finding aid, it's like an index, of, what, of all these jazz hour um, recordings. And when I looked through the finding aid, I saw Miriam Makeba being interviewed. So I went and did a, a, got a tape recording of that. And actually, I can play this for you. Do you want to hear it? OK. Two, three, eight, six, B. Second hour, Tuesday, July 11, 1961. And then there's a bit of a... There's a pause. With the Voice of America Jazz Hour. One year ago, Miriam Makeba came to America from South Africa. We will meet Miss Makeba in person tonight. Now, here she is on a record to introduce one of her songs. In my native village in Johannesburg, there is a song that we always sing when a young girl gets married. It's called the click song by the English because they cannot say Omotuan. Okay, you get the idea. Can anyone do the click? And sing. <laughs> well, you can practice. So anyway, we've got thousands of this, these recordings um, on big reels, and I would encourage you to go listen to them sometime when you have time and can get up to College Park. So. I looked at all kinds of things, and because I read her autobiographies, I, I, I understood and learned that she was married to Stokely Carmichael, who was also a supporter of the Black Panthers movement, and therefore the FBI was looking into him and looking into her. It wasn't a very good situation at the time for either of them. So we've got records now not only in Record Group 306, which is U.S. Information Agency, but now we have it in the FBI. There were also other record groups that I was really surprised that there was a video of her, a film, in the Social Security Administration records. 
because they were promoting Social Security. And out in California, in Hollywood, they were doing these interviews with with TV personalities or authors or musicians, sort of popular people. So you'll never know what you might find. Since we're talking about JFK, I want to show you some other things. These are sort of our propaganda posters. We've got thousands of beautiful posters. And as you know, space exploration was really important to his administration. And this was, I think, in Beirut. So this was popularized all over the world. And we actually, this is part of our public diplomacy. Cultural diplomacy was really important in that period. Here's another poster. Can you imagine us doing this today? That would be nice, wouldn't it? This is a movie that USIA, US Information Agency, created in 1964 after President Kennedy's assassination. It's a wonderful film. I looked at it on the weekend. And it goes over his life as, as president, and that's what the years of lightning are, all the things he managed to do and um, you know, envision and bring to fruition while she was, he was still alive, to Day of Drums, which is when he was um, uh, brought here and buried. It's very powerful. I, I'd really suggest you look at it. Here's some more of our posters. On the left side is uh, conservation. We've got Earth Day posters that we you know, send all over the world. And on the right is a different group, the US Forest Service, who did something really nice as well. I mentioned we have a lot of different places we have online records. We've also got blogs. And Krista McAuliffe was a social studies teacher. She was the first teacher in space. This was a program that was initiated during President Reagan's administration and continues until today, but in a different way. Um, it was sad that we had one of our major disasters um, with the Space Shuttle Challenger. And I wrote a blog in last year when we were commemorating the Space Shuttle Challenger. So check out our blogs as well online. We've also made it easier to, to find things by going, by, by looking at topics. And here's a topic called people, and you find research on ethnic heritage. You can research by topic, and you've got, you can actually do something on Pete Seeger. And if you don't, does anyone know who he is? Excellent. I want you to look him up. Um, because he would be a great person for this year's um, National History Day. He's a great person for next year's National History Day topics. He's one of my favorites, actually. Uh, we've got photographs on American Indians. Uh, this is a Creek person who is getting a Medal of Honor in Italy in, during World War II. Here are three American Indian women from three different tribes who served in the Marine Corps. And this is what our website looks like. You can go right there to the top and put your topic in there and see what you find. If nothing comes up or little comes up, please don't stop. We've got all kinds of ways to research. You go here. You can look at educator resources. Um, and let me show you a couple of other pages. If you do research our records, you get all of this. And I showed you a little bit about researching a topic. These are kind of some of the topics you can research. And I also would like you to go to educator resources. Docs Teach, as I mentioned, has a lot of records. But for teachers also, you've got a lot of activities you can use in class. People come here all the time, go to our presidential uh, libraries, and we've got National History Day resources. So you don't have to go all over the place to find things. We have them here ready for you. And in Docs Teach, you can find photographs like this. This was during President Kennedy's administration. We had a huge civil rights march in Washington. 
Here's Dots Teach, thousands of primary sources. Then we also have a very neat program that we support uh, National History Day called the Normandy Institute. It's junior high school students and teachers. It's a team. We have 15 teams from across the country that get selected to be in this program. They come to DC for a week. They go to Normandy for a week. But before that, they do a whole lot of research on a serviceman that they select from their town or city or state or county. Um, when they come back, they create a website on this person to commemorate what that person's sacrifice was. And I've got a team of volunteers at, at the archives in College Park who do some research to help them. So if you're doing anything on World War II or in Normandy, and if you get to be part of that program, we've put all our research that we've done here. So we make it easy for you. So we've got films that we found. We've got maps that we found. Uh, here are the, the films that are already online on our YouTube channel. And um, you can see we've got docs teach activities, um, the kinds of records that we have at FDR's museum, at Harry Truman's museum. So it's all here if that's the kind of topic you want to research. So what kind of primary sources can you find? Textual, there's motion pictures, there's maps, there's music. Did I miss anything? OK. How about are there any use restrictions? Yes or no? Yes. Um, mostly there is no restriction, but there are some, especially on photographs that may have come to us from elsewhere, motion pictures that might have come to us from elsewhere. Are they all available online? Nope. Maybe one day, uh, maybe 100 years from now, or maybe if we get a huge budget to get all kinds of people to come and digitize our records, maybe. But so th the basic thing is don't give up if you don't find it in one place, and don't give up if you don't find it online. Sometimes you actually just have to do your research and come to us. So are there any questions? Yes. Okay, let me bring you Oh, aren't you, isn't she nice to bring in the mic to Thank you? you. Um, how do you like have a chance to volunteer for? Like, how do schools g get to enter? To because you said you can go to Normandy and do research and stuff like that. Oh, right, for that particular program, it's through National History Day. So if you go on their website, you'll see the applications are due usually in November or December of each year. Mm -hmm. um, and then you follow their application process. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Yes, 14 years of age. Can you repeat the question, Judy? Yes. So, how old do you have to be to get a research card, and where do you go to get a research card? You can get a research card at any of our research facilities. Now, we said there are 44 facilities at the National Archives, but not all of them are research facilities, OK? Um, for you are here in the DC area, you can come to research at A1, which is DC, A2, which is Archives 2. And we have a registration room. You come in. You mention to the, to the uh, officers that you want to do research. They'll send you to our registration room. It takes about 20 minutes at the most to, do, to get your research card. It has a picture of you. And basically, the training gives you an idea of what the rules are in the research rooms, which there are a lot, because many of you talked about security off the records, and that's part of the training. Uh, researchers need to be 14 years of age to get a research card. However, if you're younger and come with an adult, the adult can get a research card. And I think the student can get one, do you know? Yes, but you have to be with an adult. And when you come to do research, if you're, if you're under 14, you, you have to come with an adult. There should be one adult per student, by the way. You can't have a teacher and bring 20 students. Yes? So how much research is actually done here at the archives? A lot of research is done here. Remember I told you that our earlier records are in this facility? All our paper records, generally speaking, before 1900 are here. 
A lot of people doing genealogy research come here. We've got um, congressional records here. We've got court records here. Um, I'm trying to think. We have our Indian records, Bureau of Indian Affairs records here. So there are a lot of research researchers who come. Yes. Um, let's say you use a video um, or a picture to, for your research paper. Um, how would you cite it? Ah, good question. Um, let me back up a little bit. If you're going to use photographs or videos, when you come to the archives to do research, you can actually bring your camera, you can bring a scanner, um, but you just can't bring your covers with you. You bring just the, just the device with you. We've got a page on our website that shows you how to do the citations. Um, but if you actually want that, I can send it to you, I can send it to your teacher, just, just send me a note. But it's really important, you, you saw all the information I gave you, sort of the, the record group number, mm -hmm. the photograph number, all of that is important because if someone else wants to go and check your citation, you have it all there. If you just said National Archives, it's like, so what? You know? But great question, thank you. That's my pet peeve, by the way. Time for one more. Yes. So if you said if you have a card, um, you can access the databases. Can you yes. access them from outside with the card? Or, you know, if you're in, in your office uh, away from, or do you have to be here you to access? You have to be at the, at the research facility to be able to, act, to use our public access computers to get those. You can't do it from home, no. You can't. There's no password or Correct. something to get it. Now, okay. if you use your public library, a lot of times you've got your own way of getting to the public library system. Right. You can do that from home. Okay. But again, they might not have the same full versions that we would have. Okay, so you have to be here to use the databases that Correct. are here. Okay. <laughs> Correct. All right, well, thank you, and good luck. At 11.30, we have our next speaker, Jessie Kratz, and she is going to be talking about the National Archives mission and purpose. Um, I'm basically going to talk about why the National Archives was created and then all the various jobs we have that support our mission. And I have lots of photos for you today. I'm a visual person. Well, first of all, this is, a, uh, this is an overhead image of where we're standing now in 1930. The circle is here. You notice that that's not the building that we're in. But you, um, you can see, you know, it's the, you see the, the, um, the White House. You can see the um, Washington Monument. And there was a market here where we were. It was a huge market. It had 700 vendors. They sold produce, fish, anything you can think of. But if there was a market here, where were we? Well, we didn't exist back then. We weren't created until 1934, so that's over 80 years ago. Can you, um, it's probably older than your grandparents are, so it was a long time ago. Um, if we weren't here, where were our records? Well, this is an image of the record storage be before the National Archives was created. And the records we have are from federal agencies and from courts and from Congress. And record storage was not a priority for them. So if you look at this room, probably not an ideal place to store your uh, permanently valuable records of the federal government. Um, in these rooms, there were rats, there were bugs, they were subject to theft and to fire. Um, they were um, probably, more importantly, they were not accessible to people. People couldn't research them. They were scattered all over the city and all over the country in rooms just like this. So two prominent historians, that J. Franklin Jameson and Waldo Gifford Leland, they decided that they wanted, they really needed to lobby Congress and ask Congress to create a National Archives to not only bring these records together in one place, but to preserve them, keep them 
safe forever, but also make them available to the public. So they tore down the market. This is where we were standing in, in 1931, um, completely empty. They created the building that we're in over a couple years. It was um, established, and then we went out and um, the Congress created the agency itself. The building was actually created before the agency was. And the mission of the archives was to preserve the records and make them available to the public. And that was in 1934, so again, a little bit over than 80 years ago. Then our staff went out and got all the records from all these various storage rooms and basements and attics and brought them to the National Archives. From then, from that one building, if you were here to listen to the archivist earlier, we now have 44 locations across the country um, that make the records available to the public and, um, and further our mission. So our mission is to collect, preserve, and make available the official records of the federal government. Now these are records that agencies and the courts and Congress create during their daily business. So um, about one to three percent of what they are creating is deemed permanently valuable. And that means that we need to keep them forever, so they come here to the National Archives. Why, you know, what's the importance of this? Well, records, they help us claim our rights and entitlements. They help hold our elected officials accountable. And they also document our history as a nation. So how do we accomplish this mission? Like, what are the jobs here of the people at the National Archives to help further these, these points? Well, I kind of lumped them into two different categories. One are, and this is an old, this is a picture in the 30s of, of archivists. Um, one is more um, internal facing, so sort of the behind the scenes job that you might not ne necessarily know exists um, and you don't necessarily see. So we have all these, these records being created by all these agencies in Congress and the courts, and so we need staff to be able to bring these records to the National Archives. What they normally do is they go to big record centers around the country and then they eventually make it into whatever part of the National Archives that they're supposed to live forever. We also have staff performing what we call holdings maintenance of documents. And these are basically taking the, the, the records in these boxes and putting them into these other boxes that are more appropriate for record storage. But they also go through the materials to make sure there anything in the boxes isn't there to harm the records. So they're pulling out things like paper clips and staples and things that shouldn't be in the boxes with records. And they're also organizing them and creating what we call finding aids to help researchers find these records. Because it's not enough for us just to keep these records, but we also want the public to be able to see our records. We keep our records in what's called stacks. Um, these are large rooms. Has anyone seen, been over to see the fake, the, what the, the stacks in the, um, the learning center? Has anyone been to the learning center yet? Okay, there's sort of a replica. You guys should go over there at some point today, replica stacks. This is where we keep all of our records. Um, the re this is a photo of actually one at Archives 2. Their stacks move. The ones here are just stay, but they have, you know, they have movable shelving. Um, and so a lot of our staff work in the, these sta or sta staff, work in these staffs. When researchers, researchers want to come view our records, they have to go in and find where the records are located and pull the records, let the researchers see them, and then when the researchers are done, then they refile them. We also have a huge conservation staff, and so not all the records we get come to us in very good condition. So we have staff that mend them, um, put them in appropriate housing, and if, exhibit, if documents want to go on exhibit, then our conservation staff have to review them to see if they're, um, they're they're able to be displayed safely. Um, we also have conservation staff that clean our records. Um, not all the records that come to us are in ideal um, condition, so our staff go in and clean a lot of the records. Um, this is especially true about records that have been subject to water damage or fire before arriving to the National Archives. Is anyone, everyone familiar with the term film? Film, do we all know what film is? Okay. Good. I was worried that you guys wouldn't know what film is. So well, we have a large film collection, and these are basically, you know, images on a reel that, as they spin, they're projected on a wall and create an illusion of a moving image. And this was how people went to the movies, you know, a hundred years ago. Um, we have a massive amount of film, and it's a lot of it is deteriorating, which means it's cracking or it's somehow um, being like uh, destroyed in a very, um, I guess, slow process. So our staff was trying to save these films by either repairing them 
or transferring them to digital. So we have um, staff that take these, these films and they will transfer them to a digital form and then they'll also maybe digitally restore them so people can see the films we have. Um, we, one of our, um, our goals is to is make access happen. We want to have our documents available to the public. That's a recurring theme. So we have a, a large amount of our staff that are in charge of digitizing documents. So they're scanning paper documents or you know, films or um, maps, photographs, and they're making them available to the public. Um, and then finally, we have staff that describe these documents to make them available online. We can't just put our images online and expect you to know what they are, so we have a large amount of staff that describe these documents as we put them online. Now the second sort of position, and these are very generally, generally um, general terms, are help, people who help the public. And these are the people that you'll probably run into if you're coming to research at the National Archives. So we have a lot of people that help researchers. They want to come in and they want to use our records. They want to research something. So we have staff that help the um, researchers. We also have staff that monitor the researchers in the research room. It's because these records we have, many of them are the only copy that exists. And if the researcher tries to take them or somehow tries to damage them, we, just, we need to be you know, very aware of what's going on in our research rooms to stop that from happening. We have a very large social media presence. Um, is anyone um, a follow like, the National Archives on Twitter or Facebook page or Instagram or no? Like the <laughs> you? <laughs> yeah, we have a very big social media presence. We do the um, document of the day. Um, we basically take a lot of our records and make them uh, um, give, you know, tell the story about the document and then make them available on public media, social media. Um, we also have a huge amount of staff that helps with students and teachers. And they put, um, has anyone used DocTeach? Our, um, has lesson plans and images available? It's another. So we have um, DocsTeach, which is a website where teachers can, teachers can go and find original documents and then ideas about how to teach about those documents in the classroom. And then also, we, I did mention we have our learning center where students can go in and learn about American history using our documents. And hopefully you guys get a chance to go over there today. Um, we have a, a, a public, we do a, a public program staff and events, so I would consider today, I guess, a public program. We have lots of individuals who work behind the scenes to make these things happen. Um, this photograph here is of the 4th of July, where we have a, um, we have an event every year, and we have a reenactment of, or re-reading of the Declaration of Independence, and then our staff hold up these signs to get the, um, the audience excited about um, the Declaration, and we encourage them to yell huzzah during, during those events. Um, not just here in Washington, but all over the country, we have exhibits. And have you guys toured the exhibits yet over here, or seen like the, well, have you guys have been in the rotunda and seen the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution yet? Okay. When well, we have exhibits around, um, in the rotunda and around the rotunda, um, these are ways to bring, um, to put historical documents in context and then make them available to the public. We have people who create the exhibit, so these are called curators. They're the ones who decide what's going to be on exhibit, and then they'll maybe write that exhibit label that you see by a document. And then we have other staff that their job is to actually build the exhibits themselves, and they're the ones who are putting the documents on the wall or putting the graphics on the wall. And then we have people who do do tours of these exhibits for various groups, um, including student groups, that come in and then we'll talk about the creation of the exhibit or the importance of the exhibit. Um, and finally, we have um, staff that produces videos. Um, we have a videographer and he takes the, um, the holdings of the archives or events of the archives and he makes videos and he makes them available to the public so you give an idea of what we do here at the National Archives. So, I talked about the kind of jobs we have, but why is this important? Like, why are we doing this? Who uses our records? Well, we have students who are writing papers. We have grandmothers who are researching their family histories. We have historians who are writing books. We have veterans who are seeking their pensions, and journalists writing articles, and lawyers researching for cases, and teachers who want to create lesson plans, and agencies who are looking to research their own policies. So basically everyone, including you, can research at the National Archives. Oops, so do you guys have any questions? <laughs> yes. 
Oftentimes, if you are, if it hasn't already been produced, so it's not already been microfilmed or made available through um, some sort of digital means on our catalog, you will get that box and the, the, the box of original records. So if you're researching your great grandfather's um, military file, a pension record, you might get a piece of paper that he actually signed, that actual document. So which I say it's really important that we monitor our research rooms because that piece of paper is the only one that exists. And then if something happens to that piece of paper, then we don't have that information anymore because we have 13 billion pages of textual records alone, so we haven't scanned every one of those pages yet. Um, and so, so the answer definitely is yes, you oftentimes are holding the original piece of paper. Today's document, yeah, well we have a today's document, there's an app and it's also available on, if you go to archives.gov, you can link to it. Um, and it's all, that's a really interesting, I mean, it's been going on for, oh gosh, I don't, years now. It's a fantastic resource. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, if you can just use the microphone, that's, or the microphone, that would probably be best. Got you. I can barely, and there's like a light here, so I can't even really see it. Can you talk a little bit about the diversity of the educational backgrounds of the individuals who work here at the archives? Because oh, yeah. some people might think, oh, maybe I should only major in history, or that's, this is the only place for people who are into history, but can you just talk about a, a little bit about the diversity? Oh, yes, our staff, I mean, by far has a, the, a, the most varied backgrounds. We have people who did history and museum studies and political science, and ed who did education. Um, but we also have people who did, um, like our, the uh, people who work in our conservation staff, they might have a chemistry background. They are working in sciences. Um, we have, I mean, basically, we, I mean, we don't just have, I mean, we have people who work behind the scenes in our, you know, human resources office. Um, so basically, we have people from every single background here, um, not, in, not even just in the humanities, um, in other, other sciences, sciences and other areas as well. Um, yeah. um, how old do you have to be to work in your department? I'm sorry, I didn't. How old do you have to be to oh. work in your department? Um, how old? I don't think, I mean, I think, I'm not even sure, just to be a federal employee, do you even have to be 18? I'm not sure. You don't? Mm, no. <laughs> yeah. There are student employees. All federal jobs are on USA Jobs. Um, there are a lot of seasonal positions and, and student positions that you can get while you're still in school, high school, um, college, and then once you graduate, you can transition to um, permanent and full-time work. So. Anybody else have a question? Raise your hand so I can bring you the mic. Sorry. <laughs> um, I was talking to someone, I think it was in Human Resources, I thought she did say you had to be 18 to be employed here. Is that not correct? Um, I actually do not know how old you have to be to employ here, be employed here, but we've had interns that were younger than 18 before. Younger than 18, so. okay. Thank you. And we've definitely had people who worked here when they were younger than 18 before. I know people who started at this agency at 17 and 16 and have been here for 40 years. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. And I will be back later on this morning, I guess this afternoon at 1230, to talk more about the, the um, protecting government records. And Christine Blackerby will be our next speaker starting at noon, and she'll be talking about um, using the National Archives records in exhibits. Welcome to the National Archives Building for Public Service Recognition Week. I'm happy to be here to talk to you about the kind of work I do, and I hope that at least a few of you are inspired by what we do here, that you seek out a future for yourself in history, archives, or museums. I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about my usual job, and then go into more about what my job has been lately. 
My job is to do educational and public outreach for the Center for Legislative Archives, which is part of the National Archives. That means that I work with students like yourselves, teachers, and the general public to use documents from the National Archives to increase understanding of the history of Congress, legislative processes, and representative democracy. The Center for Legislative Archives, my office, holds the historically valuable records created or received by the US Senate and House of Representatives while they go about the, the business of making or amending uh, laws for the whole nation. And to raise awareness of Congress and congressional history, I and others on the outreach staff identify historical records from Congress related to relevant events, and then we use the documents for several things. Uh, we create online classroom resources. We speak at historical, archival, and educational conferences. And we create educational publications, conduct teacher workshops, create exhibits, and also create social media content. And I know that Congress isn't particularly popular right now, but I feel very lucky to work with congressional records because every major current of American history is reflected in the work of Congress in some way. For example, technological innovations lead to new laws to regulate them. Disasters lead to congressional investigations, such as the 9-11 Commission. And uh, social problems lead to new laws that help resolve those issues. So I think that the history of America is the history of Congress. And I get to see that history up close and personal through Congress's historical records. And my job is to bring those records out of their boxes to you. On any given day, I could be digging into how Mexican laborers are treated during World War II, to what happened on Wall Street that led to the stock market crash in 1929, to why Congress declared war against Great Britain in 1812. And I love that every day my job is different. I look for documents that can be used in classrooms to help students understand what happened and why it's important, and to help students think critically about information presented in historical documents. <clears throat> Critical thinking is especially an, an especially important skill to learn, and history class is the right place to learn it. Because if you can't figure out how to extract useful information or identify false or biased information from a historical document, then you might not be able to do the same for an advertisement or a political campaign ad or a car salesman, where your incorrect interpretation or information could cost you money or time or your health. We have a lot of documents here at the archives that can be used for this, and it's my job to find the good ones in the 13 billion documents that we hold and bring them out of the box for you to see and read. One of the outreach platforms that I've already mentioned is museum exhibits, and that's what I'm going to talk about next, because that's what I've been doing lately. Last year, I co-curated a museum exhibit called Amending America, which is located upstairs in this building in the O'Brien Gallery. It highlights the remarkably American story of how we have amended or attempted to amend our Constitution in order to form a more perfect union. The exhibit features historical documents held by the National Archives that speak in some way to the more than 11,000 attempts we Americans have made to amend our fundamental governing charter, our Constitution, but the only 27 ways that we have successfully done so. There are a lot of really fascinating stories there that illustrate who we Americans think we are and think we should be. Constitutional amendments, successful and failed, provide a unique window into America, and this exhibit has attempted to capture that view. This was the first time I have created a museum exhibit, although I have regularly assisted the exhibit staff with identifying legislative records that are of interest to the curators, and I've done research, writing, and editing for previous exhibits. I discovered that curation was largely a transferable skill from my usual work, but for a significantly different audience. In a classroom, you can hand each student a facsimile of a document, and they can read it from top to bottom before considering questions about it. But not so in a gallery. The document itself must be eye-catching enough to stop someone from just walking right on by. And this means, although I was looking for documents to display from our holdings that had some significant content related to the very complex subject of our Constitution, each document also had to be short, simple, and visually appealing, which isn't always so easy to find. So what is involved in creating an exhibit? Well, to start with, you have to have an idea, 
and you have to have the materials with which to illustrate the idea. And sometimes those two things can be like a chicken and an egg. Should you start with the idea and see if you have the supporting materials in your museum's holdings? Or do you start with the materials and see if you can poke around enough before some brilliant idea presents itself? The answer is that for this exhibit, I tried both. I did some research and then looked for the connecting tissue between, between items. And then the connecting ideas suggested new research paths. And then I headed back to the books for more info, which then led to more ideas and so on. And to make this exhibit, I did a lot of research. Here at the archives, research is one of the most fun parts of the job. Flipping through old papers, I got to discover voices and thoughts that perhaps no one else still alive even knows about. And finding that one document that really illustrates a, per, or a, per, a perspective or a story is really fun and very rewarding. Once I had enough research to understand the topic well enough, to identify useful National Archives documents, uh, the co-curator of the exhibit and I brainstormed how to tell the story. Also, one of the most fun but really difficult parts of curating an exhibit is coming up with three or four different ways that you can tell one story, and then working through all those ideas until only one of them stands out as the best one and the others you discard. During this project, I learned that the very important truth that not all ideas are good ones, uh, but the best results come only when, when you're not afraid to share all the ideas, good or bad, and just being okay with the fact that some of them will turn out to be unworkable. After determining the story, the co-curator and I uh, worked with a team to construct the physical exhibit. And there are a lot of different jobs that are involved with that as well. For example, the graphic designer created all the visual images and the look of the exhibit from the color scheme to the font style on the signs. She also helped me focus on ensuring the information that I had researched and written about was presented in a visually appealing manner so that people would want to stop and read about it. The exhibit designer was the person responsible for determining the physical layout of the gallery space. He moved walls, placed lights, installed video screens, and ensured that every item on display was hung in the proper place. Our museum registrars tracked every document that was pulled from the boxes and the stacks and ensured that each one made its way to the proper space in the exhibit gallery. We also had conservators who ensured that the documents weren't damaged and others who scanned the documents to make them available in our online catalog. All these jobs and others were, were basic parts of the final product, a museum exhibit about constitutional amendments visited by hundreds of thousands of people. It was very rewarding for me to see the many pieces of this project come together and provide value to so many. I like knowing that my work helped people, including students like yourselves, understand something that could have been previously murky or unclear. Because subjects like constitutional amendments are complex, and museum exhibits like Amending America are one way that citizens and future voters like yourselves can better understand them. Knowing that my work is helpful in that way is very satisfying to me. And I feel that in my work and in my public service that I am part of the solution and that my work matters. The last part I wanted to talk to you about today is a little bit about my own personal path to this job. And the first thing to say about that is that it was not linear. I did not arrive in college knowing that I wanted to be a curator and then graduate and get a job in a museum. Um, in, in college, I didn't even declare a major until I was required to, and then I doubled up on history and political science because I didn't know which one I liked better, <laughs> didn't know which one I wanted to pursue. And even after I graduated, I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. After taking a year off school, I enrolled in graduate school and got a master's degree in education. I taught high school history and civics for a while before I moved here to Washington, D.C., and got hired at the National Archives. But my first job here was not my dream job. <laughs> it was a foot-in-the-door job answering phones. From inside the agency, however, I was able to get a better sense of the other opportunities. And I worked to get temporarily transferred to another office, to the Center for Legislative Archives, where I am now. And later, my boss hired me permanently into the position. So I certainly didn't and couldn't have planned that career path. But by continuing to investigate career options even after I had a job, I eventually ended up 
in the place that was the right place for me. So if you are interested in working in a museum, I have a little bit of advice. Uh, one is that you'll probably need a college degree, perhaps a graduate degree. A major in museum studies or public history are good choices. Internships, internships, internships. Volunteer to work, to do the work that you later want to get paid for. An internship will help you better understand what a job actually is and how you can market yourself to a person doing the hiring for a job like that. And an internship can also help you understand if a job is not the right one for you. And that information is just as important as finding a job, finding out about the type of job that you do like. Um, another idea is to try to get experience in different types of institutions. Small organizations like a local historical society will allow you to see and perhaps do a little bit of everything, like the research, writing, exhibit design, graphic design, exhibit building, and more. And then there's also large institutions like the National Archives that have more specialized positions where any given person is responsible for only one piece of the pie and you work as a team to complete the projects. So as you all move forward and decide where work will take you, I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna start. All right. Well, good afternoon. My name is Jesse Kratz. I am the um, historian of the National Archives. Today, I'm gonna talk about um, how federal records were stored uh, prior to coming to the National Archives, and then the creation of the National Archives and how they're stored now. This is Robert D. W. Connor. He was the first archivist of the United States. If you were here this morning, you saw the 10th archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, um, I'm talking to the audience. Well, when Connor moved to the National Archives building in the fall of 1935, the building was not finished yet, and it was completely empty. This large building didn't have its records yet. Well, if, if we didn't have the records, where, where, where were the records? Well, before the creation of the archives, the records were stored with their various agencies that created them, or Congress, or the courts. And as you can see, it wasn't really their priority to keep the records safe. The documents were stored in basements, in attics, in carriage houses, in abandoned buildings, basically anywhere where there was room to store records. They, they didn't have controlled access to the records. They were subject to theft, to fire. Many had rodents, rats, different sorts of bugs infesting them, and dust. Here you see you know, paint splattered next to where the records were stored. Needless to say, these were not ideal conditions for records. The National Archives was created in 1934 and their mission was really to bring in these federal records and um, preserve them and make them available for the public to use. So we rounded up all the records that were stored around the various buildings in Washington, D.C. and put them in trucks like this and brought them to the building. Since they were stored in very um, varying conditions, lots of times, like I mentioned, there were bugs and there were rodents, they had to be fumigated, which means they had to be steamed and all the infestations had to be removed before we could bring the records in. And the, box, the, the uh, carts of records were brought into these machines and then the, they, the, all the bugs and all the other materials were removed. And then we had to clean all the records before we could bring them into the stack areas where they'd be eventually stored. So you, we had oftentimes, we had people using these machines to dust um, all the records and get rid of all the, the materials that were, you know, the bugs and the materials that were within. Then we had staff that needed to arrange the records. They had to put them in the order that they needed to, um, for best research, and then put them in what we call stacks. And I just mentioned stacks. Stacks are basically where big storage rooms of shelves where we keep our records. And we put them in boxes and they're available. After they are put in the stacks, we made them available to researchers. And our research, first researcher was in 1936. But immediately after the building opened, we had to fill it. it we ran out of storage space. And the theme of, of my talk will also be how we ran out of space. Um, immediately in this building, if you notice, when you come in the main elevators, the elevator floor skip stair, skip levels, it's because originally the building was designed to have an internal courtyard. 
Um, we, we ran out of, since we ran out of storage space almost immediately, we filled that, that space with stack space and we doubled the size of how, or doubled the amount of storage we can put in our building. Immediately after we opened and we filled that second, the second part of the building, we needed to start expanding around the country. And we created what are known as federal record centers. Um, these were basically huge, these are basically huge warehouses that store inactive federal agency records. So before we get records of federal agencies, they, they have to be stored first. And these are mostly our records that aren't, aren't permanent records, they're temporary records, but in some instances they are permanent records. And so we established these federal record centers all over the country. Well, researchers realized that there's sometimes very valuable records in these record centers, and so they were going to the record centers looking to research. So in the 70s, we created these uh, field offices, which we have now. Um, they're basically archives all over the country. So we have our archives in Seattle, we have them in um, New York, in Atlanta, Fort Worth, all over the place. Um, in the Washington, D.C. area, as I said, we were moving, running out of space, we built um, the National Archives at College Park, which is Archives 2, and moved a substantial amount of our records that were in this building out there in the 1990s. We also have a significant amount of material in what are um, former mines, which are caves. Um, and in 1997, we opened our first cave. Um, the caves were built in the you know, 19th and 20th century to lay a mine limestone. And there's miles and miles of underground storage. And in the 1950s, um, we were no longer mining. So businesses decided to retrofit them and uh, create storage areas. And so they're optimal in, for space and temperature and humidity control. So we started moving a lot of operations down, down into the caves. And today we have four facilities in the Midwest that are all completely underground. One of them, this subtropolis, um, not only has you know, are plenty of room for record storage, they also have miles and miles of paved roads, there's railroad tracks down there, there's a paintball course, a laser tag course, and they do an annual 5K and 10K Groundhog Day run. So there's a lot of space, and I think that we'll probably be moving to underground facilities um, in the future. But not only do we have field offices all over the country in these federal record centers, we also maintain the presidential library system. Um, FDR is the, the, the first president to have a presidential library, and basically his idea was when he was the person who also helped create the National Archives, and so federal records were really on his, his mind. At that time, there was no law or guidance for federal records, the, for presidential records. Presidents could do whatever they want with them. They could destroy them, they could donate them to their alma mater, they can give them to the Library of Congress, but there was no law. So President FDR decided that he was gonna create the presidential library. He would build it with his own funds and all of his records would be in one spot, and then once it's open, he would donate it to, or give it to the National Archives, the National Archives would run it. So it, it was his idea to um, create this, what we call presidential library, and his, um, successors decided it was a good idea, and this is Harry Truman at his groundbreaking of his library, thought it was a great idea, and so did his predecessor, Herbert Hoover. So really, even though FDR was the first person to have a presidential library, Herbert Hoover has the oldest library. But these were all voluntary, so presidents didn't have to donate their paper or give their papers to the National Archives and have them become federal records. But um, during the Nixon administration, Congress passed some legislation requiring presidents to create these presidential libraries and presidential records to become federal records. And so the first president to have to um, abide by that was President Reagan. And here's a picture of Reagan and um, President Reagan, Nancy Reagan, at their library in Simi Valley, California. Um, our most recent presidential library is going to be Barack Obama's, our 14th president, president in Chicago, Illinois. So basically, we started with one building downtown in Washington, D.C., and now we have 44 buildings around the country. Um, so people around the nation, they don't have to come to Washington, D.C. They can do the research in their local town or the presidential library. And in just over 80 years, we went from a building that was completely empty to a building that has 13 billion sheets of paper and 600,000 reels of motion picture film, 18 million maps, charts, and architectural drawings, 400,000 sound and video re records, 9 million aerial photographs, 
17.6 million still pictures and posters, 550,000 artifacts, and I say 20 billion electronic records, but this number is outdated as I'm speaking because we're, we're acquiring them every single day. Thank you.